I got, I got a fucking, you got a hair on my fucking mic. There we go. That's how I start the show. <laughs> Episode number 701 of Let to Be Talk. Welcome aboard, everybody. It is another Monday, and I'm glad to have you here. And I want to introduce a fantastic sponsor for you. If you heard a couple weeks ago, I had Ergo hearing aids on. You're going to want to uh, listen to this one quite well. And listen, uh, meaning if you can hear me, can you hear me? Can you hear me knocking? Anyway, I got shit hearing. And I know a lot of you do too out there from going to rock concerts or riding some motorcycles or shooting guns or lighting off fireworks. Whatever it is, everybody's hearing is pride. The world is loud. The world is loud. And now you can do something about it. It's time to take the stigma off hearing aids. I wear glasses. You can see them right here. Nobody looks at me and goes, look at that dummy. But there's a weird stigma with hearing aids. And it's time to get rid of that. I don't understand why. Anything that can make me hear better, I'm on board. Ergo. It's like the size of a tiny fly it goes inside your ear. You operate it all on your uh, iPhone or your Android, whatever you have. Just download the app. You can control it all. You're tired of being in the movies and missing the most important part of the film because they're talking like this. I'm so sad. Well, it's time for Ergo. And you're going to get $360 off. That is unbelievable how good this discount is. Here, I'm going to give you the rundown. Go to Ergo. Let me get the uh, link here for you so you don't miss it. The promo code is going to be Dean360. All right, that is Dean360. And the link is, let me find the link because I've got to get my shit together. Go to Ergo dot me slash dean all right that's e-a-r-g-o dot m-e slash d-e-a-n use the promo code dean 360 and get 360 dollars off the ergo 7 that's the one i'm using it's the latest and greatest version of it so there you go we're starting the show now let's get into it Episode number 701, I've said that before, but I like to hear say it out loud, letting you know that I have done 701 of these shows. And today, we're going to dive into all kinds of great stuff. Going to talk about Leonard Skinner. Going to talk about uh, going up to the Bay Area, doing comedy this last weekend. Also, uh, diving into uh, what else are we getting into here? Um, oh, Berkeley. Haven't been to Berkeley in a long time. Walked around there. Also going to get into the Avenge Sevenfold record. We might as well start right there because I talked about Avenge Sevenfold a couple weeks ago on the podcast. Now, this is a band that I've tried to get into for years. I don't hate them. It wasn't a band like, oh, my God, they had, uh, you know, great influences. They were uh, really into GNR back in the day when they started. And it's really wild that uh, they dropped a record this deep in their career and they grabbed me. And the reason I'm saying that is I tried over and over with the Ben Sevenfold. I didn't I didn't hate him. I just was like, yeah, it sounds good. It's some some rock, but it was maybe more active rock or, or whatever the uh, industry likes to label. But they were rock and they were out there just killing it. They've uh, been doing it for years. They just sold out the fucking LA form. So they're still killing. But this particular record, I heard a song. I go, all right, I'm going to check it out. They dropped a new record and I, they dropped a single and I talked about the single. It was called Nobody. I put it on. I was like, wow, what is this? This is just crazy different. And I really was hyping it up a few episodes ago. I was like, this is great. And totally unexpected. That for me, I was like, wow, what, I, 
I didn't think this band had this in them. So I dove into the record. It came out, when did it come out here? It came out like a week ago, all right? June 2nd. And I put it on. First of all, I want to read what they have here. Um, album, first album since 2016, written in a span over four years that included during the pandemic. Life is But a Dream, that's the name of the record, was inspired by the philosophy and writings of French author and Nobel Prize winner, Albert Camus. The hypnotic lead single, Nobody, sets a reflective and pen pensive tone with orchestral strings as singer M. Shadows delivers shaky, overlapping vocal lines. Follow-up, We Love You, is an abrupt change of pace uh, with guitar burst, Mr. Bungle-like arrangement, that smashes dizzily old school thrash into a slide guitar interlude. I'm going to tell you this right now. This is not a, uh, a band that was like, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just try to be cool and do something else or whatever. This shit is authentic, man, because these songs have so many layers. It, it, it's fucking crazy how much I've been digging this record. I've been spinning it all week. Over the weekend, I spun it nonstop. And I will tell you this, it has some flavors of, of uh, Zappa. It's got some bungle weirdness. It also has some Alan Parsons vibe, Daft Punk in there. It's, it's really, really good, man. And the thing I like the most is... It's a lot like uh, Metallica. Their hardcore fans are like, we hate this record from what I'm reading. I don't know if this is true, but I was uh, reading that the band was saying they were laughing. The band was laughing because people were writing them, hardcore fans going like, what is this? This isn't Avenge Sevenfold. You get back in the studio and you make the same record over and over and over because that's all we want. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to take a ride. We want the same thing over and over. <laughs> a lot like Metallica, man. Yeah, man, I, I don't like that. I don't like this. I don't like that. Anyway, if they end up ditching a lot of the old fans and they're growing and this record grabs people like me who are like maybe into something with a little more depth and something outside the box, then that might be a fucking cool thing. It was a lot, a lot like uh, when I started comedy. For years and years, I was just grinding it out, getting a little bit of success, and people would be like, why'd you quit music, man? Like they just wouldn't accept that somebody could do something different in their life, which is absolutely crazy to me. And... Uh, I just don't really understand that. But this fucking record, the album cover art, it is fantastic. It's kind of a, like a Stedman type of uh, painting. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to get M Shadows on the show. I DM'd um, their guitar player because I did his podcast, Johnny Christ. And I'm hoping to get both of them on or I really want to talk to M Shadows because the vocals on this record are insane. But I'll tell you something that's really fucking insane on this record is the drumming and the guitar playing. Actually, the I'm, I'm going to just say the whole band is killing it. But man, there's points on this record where the drumming, you're just going like, what the fuck? And it, it is killer. Opening song, game over. Then into uh, Mattel, Nobody. We Love You, Cosmic, Beautiful Morning, Easier. And then these three songs in a row that spell God. Eight, track eight is G, track nine is Ordinary, track 10 is Death. And then Life is But a Dream. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a fucking, a wild ride. And uh, I'm happy I found it. I'm happy I took the chance to check it out instead of just being like, nah, I'm not listening to that. And between the Rival Sons record and this record, I've been just in a full rock mode all week. In between 
spurts of full-blown Waylon Jennings, which is back in my life. I love music, man. I love music for that. Just shit comes back into you, goes out, comes back in. At just different periods of time, you're like, fuck, I'm, I'm full-blown Waylon Jennings right now. <laughs> and uh, it, it, that's just a beautiful thing. But anyway, check it out. Life is but a dream. I hope to get him on the podcast. And, um, you know, I might go back and try to get into some of the other records because I know I'm going to get these DMs. Dude, you ought to check out their early stuff. You know, you got to check out their early stuff. You may go back and give it another try. <laughs> People act like I just don't listen. To Dude, I put shit on over the years. I'll try to figure shit out. I'm not uh, jagged and, and one dimensional. I'll put shit on. I'll go, mm, didn't grab me this time. But maybe in a couple of years, I'll put it back on and check it again. Perfect example is all the bands that I hated growing up. Pink Floyd, Bruce Springsteen, all of that stuff. Grateful Dead. They're all my favorites now. And thank God. Thank God I'm not one of those tumbleweeds that just fucking says, nah, forever. Because holy shit, man. That's some of the best music I've ever heard in my life. You know, Springsteen, can you imagine not, not listening to uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town or uh, Born to Run? Fuck, come on. Speaking of that, uh, Dead & Co., I can't keep, I can't stop talking about it. I don't know what the fuck they're drinking, but I want some of it because I'm constantly trying to be the best. And these guys have gone to another level again and again this tour. Uh, Patreoner Tommy, my man Chicago Tommy, he uh, sent over some clips from the Chicago Wrigley Field. They were doing Watchtower and John Mayer just going another fucking level on the guitar, just killing it. He's playing a Charvel, a San Dimas Charvel with a, with a Powell Peralta, Peralta sticker on it. He's just murdering Watchtower, just sounding great. And the band is that I've, I've decided, fuck it. I said I wasn't going to take uh, any time off uh, and just try to do comedy as much as I can this year, but I have to go to the last three shows, so I'm doing it. I'm going to go to San Francisco and see the last three Dead & Co. shows at Pac Bell Park, whatever the fuck they call it now. It's always going to be Pac Bell to me, just like Candlestick. I've said it over and over. It's Candlestick. It's Pac Bell. Those are those are what they're called. So I'm going to go see that because it's just blowing my mind what clips I'm seeing. And I'd be an idiot not to go see the end. I saw the Fare Thee Well, the end of The Grateful Dead. I'll see the end of Dead & Co. And it'll be in uh, San Francisco, the old hometown which I was just in. I was just up in San Fran all weekend. Actually, I was in Nevada, or not Nevada. I clown on Nevada <laughs> on my last show there. But I was in Santa Rosa, and I was in Alameda doing shows. And shout out to Jason and the uh, Alameda. I want to get this right so you can follow him because this guy's a fucking solid human. Ooh, Skinner right there, just blasting over my thing. Um, I want to get this right because this guy's a, a, an amazing person in the comedy world. He books me a couple times a year and he just busts his ass. Alameda Comedy Works. Give it a, uh, a follow on Instagram. Boy, Alameda Comedy Works. And shout out to Jason. Two nights I did in Alameda. And I did Santa Rosa at the old Acapulco, which was a, a Mexican restaurant back in the day where I'd go there and hit the happy hour for free. They had like free taquitos and mini, uh, mini tacos and shit. You buy like a beer and just eat as much as you can because you're in a band and you don't have any money. That was the key to survival in the 80s, playing music. If you were broke, you would uh, go to happy hours. They were all over the place. And you would kind of have them mapped out in your wallet, pre-cell phone or anything. You just have a little map. 
Tuesday. Oh yeah, the Flamingo, they got a happy hour. Wednesday, oh, Spirit Cafe, it's got a happy hour. And you'd go in, you buy a beer, because of course you, you, you're gonna buy a beer before you buy food. And then you would just eat everything they had over there. <laughs> just four long hairs coming in, sideburns, stinking from work and construction all day. Me and my former boss, George, we just roll into the happy hour, get a couple beers, and demolish their free food like a bunch of fucking lizards. They're just over there. Just like, Man, I think about it now. Like if I was in a, 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 a bar or a restaurant and I saw just people come in, just destroying them, I'd be like, look at those jackasses. <laughs> Holy shit just ripping the happy hours man does anybody remember do they still have them i don't know because i don't drink or hang out in bars anymore it's been 100 years but just fucking crazy anyway uh so the santa rosa gig was great uh so many old school friends came out joey and fletch were there john tipton one of my old buddies that had the he's a rich kid but he wasn't a dick he was a cool rich kid he actually worked. He wasn't one of those fucking lackeys living off his dad. He worked his ass off. He had a gold, I think it was like a 79 or 78 Trans Am. He had the gold one, which, which makes me still love the gold one with the fucking bird. And we would just be out cruising at night, drinking, throwing the cans out the window. I told the story once, but we were flying down the road and a, um, a uh, what are those called? Those fucking uh, possums. Those possums are fucking, they look like Satan just with their weird claws. It ran out in front of us. We, wrote, we drove over it. It was so fucking big. It knocked his driveline off. The car did like a fucking jackknife. Just straight Burt Reynolds smoking the bandit style. Full cross up, landed, spun out, no driveline, couldn't go anywhere. But we're shit faced. We had to just kind of leave the car and, and run home and then pick it up in the morning, you know? Anyway, John Tipton was there and uh, a lot of old school friends, some Patreoners in the house, Jill, Chris Dash, uh, Paul, Paul Machado. A lot of fucking Steve. Who else was there? Oh, Craig Bearhorse came out. One of my old, old friends, man. I go way back with fucking Craig. Ruffians Craig. And it's so cool that people come out and still, you know, leave their house in their 50s. Because so many people just don't go out once they turn like 40. That's it. They're just done. But to see old school friends out and lots of them, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm slipping right now on, I didn't take notes on everybody there. Oh, Cindy Poon was there. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, Mark was there. Uh, I forget his last name, but it was me, Cindy Poon and Mark. And we worked for the Stones for years and it was a Stones tour reunion. We were all three there together and it was the first time i'd seen mark in 17 years it was so cool anyway so that was rad it was it just felt good to be up in the bay area and see a lot of old school friends and it's funny to talk to people after the show because i work so hard at trying to get somewhere and I don't really know where I'm at. I know I'm not fucking beginner. And I know I'm I'm not, you know, I know I'm not the fucking greatest. But people were telling me that it's funny. They go, man, you're getting way better. And that feels good. But I, it's so bizarre because I can't really tell. I'm just doing the fucking comedy and and trying to get better but you can't tell you're not sitting around going man i'm getting fucking good 
So it was, uh, it was cool to hear that from a lot of people. Cause I just, I just really cannot tell actually I'm just engulfed in comedy. I've done over how many dates have I done this year? I think it's like 338 or something. Let me look. And, uh, no, 141. So 141 shows this year. And, uh, you know, I just, I just, it's fucking hard. Comedy is so hard. When I get off stage, even if I feel like it went well, I'm like, God damn, this shit is hard. Like, I know I got a handful of shit that's going to make people laugh. If you didn't, you wouldn't be able to do an hour, you know? <laughs> Excuse me. I'll tell you one thing, though. This was the first time I'd been back to the Bay Area since my mom had passed. And it was pretty rough, actually. Uh, I kept it inside. But I was cruising around to the spots we used to hang and places we lived. And a lot of memories were coming out. A lot of memories. And they're great, great memories. But they're also really hard to think about without my mom, you know, she's just gone. And, and a lot of times I, I feel like I I'm still trying to just press it down and act like it didn't happen just so I don't fall apart. But, you know, it's been, I don't know, six months now and man, to be up back in the Bay area, that's so much of my mom there. That's where we, that's where we lived, man. And it was just, it was it was heavy to be there since that had happened. So shout out to you, mom. Went by some of the old cribs and uh, went by some of the old food spots we loved. Different stuff like that. Stomped around Berkeley. Hadn't been to Berkeley in probably 25 years. It's the same. Berkeley, I feel like has never changed. It's got that Telegraph Avenue with Amoeba Records. That was the original Amoeba. I would go there on Saturdays, park the car, fucking find parking, get a get a burrito, eat it, and then head into Amoeba and just dig through those those files, those those bins, and then find rock memorabilia just old cool posters and photos and shit, which by the way, I want to tell you this right now. I have some stuff for sale and I'm in this part in my life now where I feel like I have pretty good taste in fashion and architecture. But one thing I don't understand, I know what I love. I love interior design but I don't know how to put it together. You know, like I go into other people's houses and I'm like, this is perfect. This is absolute, or it's not perfect. I'm like, yeah, this is a fucking shit show. But I'm at that point in my life where I want to find somebody because, you know, you go somewhere and you go, okay, I want this piece of furniture, that piece and that piece. And you go home and you go, man, I fucked up. You know, there's some people that get all of the same shit. Their house just looks like a showroom. Then there's other people that have eclectic taste and they put together pieces in their house and everything has a story and it's cool. You're like, man, what about this chair? Oh, you like, you like that chair? Yeah, that's from the 50s from a Japanese designer who loved Eames. So he made his own chairs. And you're like, whoa, wow, that's crazy. How do you find that? Oh, I was at a flea market in Oklahoma and it was just there, perfectly mint. I like that kind of shit. So you get to that point in your life where it's time for the rare rock posters to go. Uh, they're framed. I don't need rock posters anymore. The only kind of rock and roll I'm going to have in my house is incredible photography because I think photography is some of the greatest art and talking pieces when you're in a house and you look at it. Now, look, I got a couple great posters I'm going to keep, but I've got some rare Black Crows stuff framed, like the Amorica promo photo. I've got the uh, Who Killed That Birdie on the window seal. That's a, their old uh, 
laser disc. Remember laser disc? Uh, that that's a great fucking film. If you've never seen that Black Crows documentary, it's pretty rare. I don't know. It might be on YouTube, but Who Killed That Birdie on the Window Seal is basically kind of an early documentary from um I guess it's the Southern Harmony era into America. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but the poster is rare as fuck. It was hanging in like warehouse records, now available on laser disc. Um, and then I've got a, a rare ACDC Highway to Hell tour poster with Judas Priest opening, playing in the uh, UK. I have stuff like that all framed. And it's just time to switch it up, get into some classic shit, some nice classic furniture, some uh, classic books and photos around. I kind of wish that like Dennis Hopper was still alive and he would just come in. And whenever I see Dennis Hopper, I was just looking at his photo book today. Whenever I see Dennis Hopper's houses and stuff, you know, like photos of it, it's just like, you know, like in Taos, New Mexico or in Venice, you just look at his house and he's like, this fucking guy had it. He just had the good taste on the inside. So I want to get into that. I want to find somebody that can help me curate just kind of a clean, minimalist look with rad photos. So the rock poster era is going to be over for the old Dean Del Rey. And, um, you know, if you live in L.A., I'm selling some of the stuff. Hit me up. And if you don't live in L.A. and you're willing to pay shipping, it's going to be a lot of money. These pieces are fucking big. They're big ass wall posters framed. The frames alone were two hundred dollars. So you get the idea. It's it's primo shit. But um, anyway, interior design, man, I get all my ideas from going to open houses. I went to a couple of open houses yesterday. Fresh back from the three headlining weekend, totally tired, but had to go. I wanted to go look at these houses, these three houses, and see what they looked like on the inside. Snap photos, dig through Instagram. You guys are like, what is this fucking interior design talk? Fuck you. Talk about something else. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you see this shit behind me? This is how I want something to look. But I don't need it to look like I fucking live in the Mad Men TV set. You know, I don't need that. I don't need to look like I'm, I'm you know, back in the day, you, you go to those time travelers houses, those rockabilly people, and they got the fucking, you know, they, they still got the rotary dial. Everything's like rockabilly. I don't need to be fucking that. I just want it to be comfortable, but cool. Speaking of that, let's all uh, have some positive thoughts for Mike Ness of uh, Social D. I guess he had a little cancer on a vocal cord and canceled the tour. I think it's only stage one. So that's very, very uh, good. Uh, not good, but better than stage four. So positive thoughts for Mike Ness. This guy is a goddamn soul, soldier, soldier distortion. I've seen him many times. One of the great, great, great legends, Mike Ness, man. And uh, he's getting some treatment and then he's going to get back out on tour. They were busy working on a new record. And uh, holy shit, man, he is a he's a he's an American legend. The guy has just absolutely slayed it for years. And I'll tell you, some of his songwriting is so damn good. That song, Drug Train, Ball and Chain, this guy has a army of great tunes. And his following, his fans are just in next level. They're, it's like Metallica. He's got like three generations. You go to a social distortion show, there'll be like an eight-year-old there dressed up full-on rockabilly with like a slick back hair and, uh, you know, some suspenders and like Ben Davis and shiny like buckle shoes or, or creepers, that shoe creeper. I never wore creepers. I never got into those, but a lot of my friends did. Izzy Stratton from GNR was a big creeper fan. 
he would wear them. Uh, my buddy, uh, Roger Rocha, who was at the show, Four Non Blondes uh, guitar player, another fucking solid human, comes to a lot of my shows. Britt Pineda, another uh, Pinella. Wait, how do, I got to see how to say Britt's name. It's been so long. I'm old. I'm actually old. You know, I've known this guy played in a band with him. And I just know, I was like, wait, how do you say his name? It's uh, Brit on the Boat is his Instagram, by the way. And uh, he's a fucking lifer like me. Just out there playing rock and roll or, you know, I don't put Brit Pinella. Anyway, he uh, he was at the show. Roger, Four Non Blondes guitar player. These guys, uh, solid humans. I got sidetracked for a minute on the Creeper shoe, but Mike Ness, let's give him some fucking love. Right? God. How about Social Distortion? I want to see how many records they got. You know? It's unbelievable. I uh, I have seen them so many times. They do these Christmas runs every year. And uh, God, this record is such a masterpiece right here. He's had, he's got, I'd say he's got two masterpieces. He has the 1990 social distortion record. And, uh, so far away, so far away, so far away. God, his voice is cool. His gold top plays that Les Paul gold top. Just killing it. Let it be me. Let it be me in the morning. Oh man. I love this guy's story of my life. This record is a masterpiece. Sick boy, sick boy, cover of Ring and Fire, Ring of Fire, Ball and Chain. Oh my God, this whole thing is a fucking 10. It could have been me. She's a knockout. She's a knockout. A place in my heart, drug train. There it is, 41 minutes, 10 songs. Unbelievable. Nobody sounds like social distortion. They sound like they're self- they- He's got his own fucking thing. Then in 92, he drops somewhere between heaven and hell. Cold feelings, bad luck, born to lose, uh, 99 to life, ghost town blues. I mean, there's two back-to-back crushing records there. White light, white heat, white trash. Good record also, man. Um, So just think about that. Fucking how long this guy's been going. 1988, Prison Bound, Mommy's Little Monster, the first record. This guy is, I mean, get him in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How are, a lot of people complaining about different people. How is this guy not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? He has his own fucking thing, man, his own vibe. He's been doing it for 100 years. He's going to get over this cancer. He's going to come back out. He's going to drop a record. And he looks great, too, right now. I wonder how old he is. Let's see how old he is. Because I saw a picture of him, and I couldn't even believe it was him. Because he looks a little different now. But he just... Okay, Mike Ness, Social Distortion, formed in 79. He was born in 62. So... You know, old bad at math, Dean. I'm actually not bad at math. It's it's really the uh, thing I'm pretty good at because uh, <laughs> you got to know that when you're counting fucking money and the and the promoter tries to rip you off, you, that's forty percent right there. Yeah, are you sure? Are you sure it's forty percent? Yeah, man. You just leave. Yeah, you gave us forty <laughs> percent. You fucking you dummy. So he's 61, unreal. It looks fucking great. Orange County, he is Orange County to me, man. Not the uh, n- not the political side. I'm talking about that old school punk rock Orange County vibe. So funny how some of the greatest punk rock came out of Orange County. Really wild. I'm looking at his equipment. Les Paul gold top with decals. That's how they describe it. <laughs> Whoa, in the early days, he played SGs. I never saw him play an SG. Uh, and then he got into the deluxes, you know, with the mini humbuckers. That's the thing I always saw him play. I, I don't like those mini humbuckers. 
If you don't know what that is, uh, they're just, you know, Gibson's has P90s, which is kind of a dirty kind of single coily kind of thing. And then they got the humbucker, which is the classic Jimmy Page and, and all of that. And then they made these little ones, uh, you know, soap bars. Oh, no, soap bars, I think, was the nickname for P90. Anyway, these mini humbuckers, I always call them ice picks because they just fuck up your ears. Just damn high, Andy. I never understood the mini humbucker, but some people could wrangle it and some people could really uh, make it sound good. Mike Ness has his own sound and uh, his own everything. Here we go. Um, Ness recalled seeing Neil Young's guitar uh, stock with mini humbucker pickups out of the Les Paul Deluxe. He threw them in the trash and replaced them with P90s. Nest gold tops have maple necks, which he says contributes to the tone, especially when he's using a capo on the second fret. It's a funny thing. I, I remember Chuck Prophet, who I had on the podcast about, I don't know, maybe eight years ago or something. But if you don't know Chuck Prophet, another Bay Area legend, do yourself a favor and go listen to him. But he used to do the funniest thing when he would put the capo on his guitar he would announce it to the crowd. He'd go, for those of you taking notes, uh, this song requires the capo on the second fret. <laughs> that, was, that was one of his rock raps. It was just so amazing. It requires a capo on the second fret. And then he would mount it up and kind of show it to you. There it is. See? <laughs> anyway. Uh, I feel good, man. I feel good about this episode. I'm kind of all over. And uh, I guess you figured by now it is a solo episode. Yeah. Um, but I do have some guests coming up, but I am enjoying the solo episodes. And thank you for uh, the kind words on last week's solo episode, getting into that Brady Bunch house and um, and the Josh Free stuff and the AI shit. So thank you so much. That was episode 700 motherfuckers so um i will tell you this i always do say promote what's great not what you hate i'm a big believer in that i can easily dip into the negative world and i choose not to do it because it it kind of just especially when you're around other people after a while, it's just like, ah, this guy's so fucking negative all the time. So I try not to ever do that. But once in a while, I have to lay down my foot and be like, nah, man, what are you doing? And in this particular case, it has to do with uh, David Lee Roth re-recording a lot of these Van Halen classics. Now, he's been doing it for the last six months, and I'm sure he's doing it so he has full ownership and he can place them in movies and TV commercials because it's a new version. And he doesn't have to cut anybody in. He's just like, here, I re-recorded these. And thank you very much. You know, uh, the old case of like when Death Leopard re-recorded Hysteria because they were getting the short end of the stick on the streaming and they didn't want to fuck around with that, with the record companies and stuff. So they did their own version. That all got settled. Def Leppard is all over streaming now and they got paid properly. So David Lee Ross been recording these classics. He did, I think he did, uh, I think he did Dance the Night Away. Uh, he's done a few. And recently, last week, he dropped Atomic Punk. And I will tell you this. I am a huge Van Halen fan. Huge. But there comes a, a time in people's careers where they start to fuck up their legacy. And I don't know who's around them. I know Dave doesn't need money. Uh, there's just no way. His family was rich. He wrote all of the fucking lyrics. He ran Van Halen. This guy has armies of fucking money. He's never been married. He has no kids. There's really no one around to leave his money to. I think he's got a sister. 
But other than that, he's got enough money to fuck off for the rest of his life and have fun. Now, why he chooses to record this, if he's recorded him to get him into movies and stuff, to pick up an extra change, it is not worth it to me to dilute your legacy and pollute the sound of how incredible Van Halen is. Now, look, when he used to do the covers in the Eat Em and Smile band with Steve Vai and Billy Sheehan, absolutely killer. Those guys are fucking doing it. But whoever he's got playing on this record, and he's he's just, it's not really a record, it's just these songs he's tracking. And he's over there bragging like, yeah, man, no auto-tune, want first take vocals, this is the goods. It's not, man. The melodies are terrible. The performance is flat. The band is just, it's just awful, man. And I hate to even say that stuff because it's negative. But it's like somebody needs to tell Dave, hey, man, Eddie's gone, man. Let's just, let's just live in the glory of some of the greatest rock music ever recorded. Let's not put these diluted versions out. And, and I heard a couple guys on Sirius XM. They were like, yeah, Dave's out there recording these. He sounds better than ever. I'm like, what? Why would you say that? There's no fucking way you believe that. You're going to say he sounds better than ever. You're going to say he sounds great. You're going to put on Atomic Punk by David Lee Roth over Atomic Punk by Van Halen. No fucking way. Now, you don't need to trash him. I'm not trash. I'm not trying to go out of my way and trash him. I'm saying this is one of my favorite humans of all time. And somehow, you know, he's kind of uh, lost his, his, his way. And, uh, you know, it's just a bummer. It's just a bummer when I hear these songs and, and, and then he does these weird vaudeville. But he, he's an old man now. There's some people that are old and they're still fucking cool. They're still in the game. They still out there. They're, they're understanding that the world is changing and it's moving and they advance with it. Like I said before, a Dennis Hopper guy is on, he was on point till the day he died. There's guys out there that stay cool forever. And there's other people that lose it and that's okay. It's impossible to be cool all your life. I think it's almost impossible to do that. There's some people that I see and I go, they'll be cool all their life. But Josh Homme, Queens of the Stone Age, that guy just reeks fucking cool. You know, I see him, I just go, ah, that guy's fucking cool, you know? But it's okay to not, you know, I mean, it, it's just it's just impossible to stay cool. I mean, it's it's hard to stay in the game on anything in this world that is just changing constantly right now i'm constantly learning and and advancing in this comedy world that's changing with clips and instagram and tiktok and you know you got to constantly be writing you got to constantly be out in the mix and my only uh demon right now is uh facing the phone if i can get my face out of the phone i'm going to get a little further quicker but i like the phone because it gives me stuff to write about and i've seen all kinds of shit in my life so i'm like oh, i'll just look at the phone oh that's funny instagram is a demon and it is a pleasure i was on there yesterday and this skinnered video pops up from dan the green and immediately i just sit down and start watching it Steve Gaines, Alan Collins, smoking guitar solos. And I just instantly stop in my tracks. And I look at that and I just think, how fucking cool is this? In the palm of my hand, I have one of the greatest Skinner performances of all time. Oakland Coliseum, Dan DeGreen, 
with Peter Frampton, 1977, a short time before the plane crash. That is fucking awesome to me. Just to sit down and look at that. And then you scroll after that, and it's a French bulldog sitting up eating watermelon. <laughs> it's equally awesome to me. Like, what the fuck? So, you know, like I said, man, Dave, I don't think, I don't, you know, Dave, Dave is so fucking mind boggling to me. The mystique, the, the craziness of him. I don't know who he hangs out with. I don't know where he hangs out. Once in a while, he pops up here and there. He's never been at the comedy store since I've been there, unfortunately. I've been trying to get him on the podcast for 11 years now. And he is one of the all-time greats. But I could probably imagine I would be kind of spun out, too. If I was in something, the level of Van Halen, I mean, the the ride that that was for those years, and then all the years after that, just in your mind, you're just Diamond Dave, and the world's changing, and you're walking around, look at all the V.I. Oh, yeah, all right, in my life, I'm dying. <laughs> I'd love to see Diamond Dave at Trader Joe's, right? He's just walking around. I like the trail, like the, the trail mix when I'm out on the road. You know what I mean? I get a barbell protein bar and I look in the sky and I feel like I'm high. Trader Joe's used to be a friend of mine on a ship out on the jungle studs. That's right, right indeed, my friend and girl. Why looking in your eye with a four face? Yeah, with a hearing aid by ear go. <laughs> oh, man. Cooking. I'm cooking out there. Um. <laughs> uh, oh, hey, Patreon, new Patreoners. I got to tell you, man, sign up for the Patreon, Dean Del Rey. It's patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Sign up and get these bonus episodes. They're out there. I'm doing them for you guys. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy Zooming with the Patreoners. I enjoy meeting the Patreoners. Oh, that reminds me. I want to give a shout out because, uh, you know, a bunch of Patreoners came out, but, um, uh, I want, I want to talk about this for a minute because I was talking about my mom and Todd Kent came up to me. He's a Patreoner and he's a solid human. And he just said, hey, man, I just, I want to, uh, you know, my my father passed recently and, you know, I want to just let you know that it's, uh, you know, it's fucking tough. And his wife told him, take some time off, you know. Unfortunately, I can't take time off uh, I don't have a regular job, but I, you know, if I take time off, it just fucking slips back. I just keep driving, but it was great to see him. But patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. I want to give a shout out to Catatonic has returned to the Patreon and he's an old friend of mine and he used to make all of the Del Rey stickers and maybe we'll get some more stickers made. And speaking of that, tour dates and merch is at deandelray.com. Lots of fucking tour dates. A lot of tour dates out there with Bill Burr coming up. A lot of headlining dates coming up. And some Vegas dates. I'm going to be at the uh, at the Comedy Cellar in Vegas. Uh, here you go. June 22nd. It's going to be at uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. June 23rd. Bridgeport, Connecticut, June 24th, Newark, New Jersey, and June 29th and 30th, Lincoln, California. Uh, July 6th, it's Allentown, Pennsylvania, because I'm living here in Allentown. July 7th, Atlantic City, the boardwalk. I haven't been there since I opened for Alice in Chains. God, that was a great night. And July 8th, uh, Atlantic City. So those are some of the bird dates. Give him a big happy birthday. He turned 55 on Saturday. I love that man. Great human. He's fucking been a huge help in my career. And just a great friend. I mean, even if he, 
even if we weren't in comedy together, it's just a, a just a fantastic friend. Perfect age for me to hang out with because we can we can talk about anything, man. Just fucking, you know, all we can go all over the board. But anyway, Bill Burr, happy birthday, yeah. Interesting thing, I will talk about comedy. I don't have the uh, manager or agent, so it's tough to get gigs. But there are cool people like Jason that are out there doing full-blown comedy shows in alternative venues. And it looks like in my career at this point, I'm going to have to start doing a lot of these style venues. And I like doing them because it's not the traditional five shows in a weekend in a club where you're just the drink salesman. I do enjoy doing them. This particular one was in Faction Brewery in Alameda this weekend. And it was a massive venue. It looked like something where they would film the finale scene of a Terminator movie, you know, with the giant brew, uh, steel fucking uh, brew things, you know, where they brew the beer, the huge silos. It looked like something, you know, like Arnold would throw a person in, you're dead now, fool, and throw you in one of those, he'd melt in acid. Ah. It was a great venue, man. It was out on the Alameda Naval, I guess it's the old Naval base. And uh, I said this uh, about a year ago when I did Alameda. I like Alameda, man. I lived in the Bay Area all my life, never went to Alameda maybe two times somebody would be having a party their dad lived on the base and they would sneak people on the base and have a big ripper the base is abandoned now probably full of radiation <laughs> i was saying like five years from now like yeah man looks like uh looks like that uh faction brewery got you boy but um it's a massive massive piece of property in the bay area that's probably worth billions, but it probably has a bunch of fucking old naval shit like paint and mercury and radiation and shit all in the soil. I don't know. But eventually they're going to uh, probably tear all that shit down because the views are a perfect view. Waterfront property looking at San Francisco. It is beautiful and the whole area is peaceful. There's no one around. It's just these giant fucking airplane hangars. And one is a brewery, one's a winery. And then they got the old fucking naval gym, the, the gym out there, like the, uh, where the, I guess the families used to work out. That's still open like a gym, but it was wild to be out there just telling these jokes in this fucking big warehouse. And they let people bring their dogs. There were some French bullies in there and some other kooky dogs. I'm doing jokes. And also a little dog fight break out. <laughs> Getting heckled by fucking some kind of weird rescue schnauzer thing. Going after a, a English bulldog. It was fucking cool, man. So, you know... It, it, it's definitely hard to do comedy in a venue like that because it's humongous and echoey. So you got to wrangle it and you got to figure it out. And there's a lot of people in there. So it, it when the laughs hit, it would explode in there. And you had to go slow. But I had a great time. And, uh, you know, if I got to do these type of venues, then I got to keep doing them just to... Uh, to keep uh, working, you know? And I don't mind. I, I, I want to find a way to get bigger as a comedian, like in a Joe Coy way. You know, if you're not part of the, the, the tight clicks, if you're not in this scene, or if you're not with this agent, or if you're not with that manager, you got to fucking figure it out. And you can't quit. And you can't complain. You just keep going and you hope that the fans grab on and keep telling people it's all about the fans. Cause if the people don't go out, then you have to quit because <laughs> yeah, you have to do comedy. It's not like music where you can just put music up on, on the internet and hope that people find it on Instagram and TikTok and SoundCloud and, and YouTube. 
comedy is not like that. So if the people don't show, you're fucked. So thank God the people came out over the weekend. And I thank all of you. And thank all of you that listen to this podcast too. And all of your support. I hope to see you on the road. Keep the candles lit, my friends. And um, subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. And leave a review on the iTunes. I saw three new reviews last week. That's a lot, believe it or not. You got 150, 200,000 people listening to the podcast. You get about... 50 out per gig. You get about two reviews a month. I figured it out. You need to have like, they say 10,000 or a thousand true fans is true. But I think you have to have about 1 million fans to be able to do about 200 people per venue. Because uh, <laughs> the amount of people that come out from the 1 million is about this small. So you got to, you got to have about 1 million people. So uh, I think I'm at 60, 68,000 on Instagram. I'm a long ways away, but I ain't stopping. Fuck all y'all. All right. I love you. Keep the candles lit. I'll see you out on the road and uh, I'll see you on Patreon uh, Zoom Fest. And thank you so much for tuning in. See ya later. Oh, don't forget. Listen to that Avenged Sevenfold and that Rival Sons record. And go get on some... Uh, some fucking uh, social distortion. Huh.